everyone, uh, and welcome to our session on digital platforms and competition and regulation. Uh, my name is Alexey Prekhanyak. I'm a fellow at Lincoln College at Oxford. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Fabian Kortemuye. Uh, Fabian is uh, the director of economics in Google, where he worked since 2011, and he works in close relation with Hal Varian on the development of that data driven insights and on research to evaluate the economics value of uh, Google and the internet. So he also leads economic analysis in all competition and regulatory process involving Google on a global level. He previously uh, was a senior consultant, uh, consultant uh, uh, in the European competition policy practice at NARA Economic Consulting. And he has his whole education uh, from the University of Oxford, where he obtained a BA in economics and management, and later MPhil and doctorate in economics. And he was a lecturer at Balliol College for two years. So today, Fabian is going to share his insights on digital platform regulation. And there are many new international efforts to design a new regulatory regime to apply to large technology companies, such as Alphabet, Apple, Meta, Amazon, and so on. So Fabian will illuminate uh, some of the key issues he had play and discuss the role of which data plays in this company's business. So Fabian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexei. Uh, well, it's a, a great pleasure to be uh, here with you all today, uh, albeit uh, virtually, uh, would even be nicer in, in person, of course, and uh, definitely a rush of uh, nostalgia of, uh, you know, doing an event uh, with an Oxford uh, angle. Uh, so even even virtually, I mean, such uh, nice memories of uh, of the times there. But, you know, maybe we can uh, come to, to that later. Uh, our topic today, as uh, Alexei outlined, uh, so, you know, digital platforms, competition and regulation, that's, uh, you know, a topic I've been bathing in uh, for the last uh, 11 years or so uh, at Google. Uh, you can uh, imagine just from newspaper reporting what a walk in the park uh, that has been. Uh, but uh, let me line up my uh, slides uh, so that we, we have some materials to, uh, to look at jointly. Here we are, and I'll blow these up uh, for you. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to give you a very sort of, uh, you know, policy, uh, you know, heavy um, uh, view from the trenches, uh, I would say, but of course, with uh, very much an economic angle, uh, as since I am, uh, you know, through and through uh, an economist. Uh, but the policy context for the talk is is pretty easy, and all of us are are familiar uh, with it. It's uh, well illustrated by uh, these two covers uh, from the Economist magazine from uh, recent years, uh, where uh, you know nowadays uh, a lot of this, uh, you know. Uh, newspaper reporting uh, looks at, uh, you know, tech companies, especially the ones in the famous GAFA uh, acronym. So Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. I mean, sometimes people put an M at the end to include Microsoft. Uh, and essentially, they look at them and they say, well, you know, these are uh, all powerful companies. They have grown too big for their boots. Uh, and essentially, they're terrorizing the economy as per the cover on the left. Uh, and, you know, really, we need to do something about it. Uh, you know, um, antitrust enforcement uh, needs to be dialed up. Uh, or increasingly, uh, there are calls for ex-ante regulation or indeed plans uh, on the road uh, for ex-ante regulation of uh, this sector, as uh, hinted by the cover on the right. Uh, so I'm going to you know, try to take a step back on all of this, uh, give you a little bit my perspective uh, on, on these issues. Uh, so the menu for today is to share a little bit how I see uh, the shape uh, of competition online uh, with a special stop uh, to discuss data very briefly on this uh, whistle stop uh, tour, uh, because that's kind of part and parcel of so many conversations, and then discuss very, very briefly, uh, you know, one particular conduct that's kind of uh, flagged uh, oftentimes in these conversations, namely uh, what's uh, called uh, self-preferencing, but, you know, we'll get that there in a moment. Uh, but we should have plenty of time uh, for discussion, I, I should say, as, you know, I, I always enjoy the Q&A portion of these things the, the most. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let me flip to our uh, starting point here. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, by taking you guys through the sort of Google slash Alphabet, uh, you know, business model, which is uh, a good starting point. It's, of course, what I know best, but it's also, uh, you know, fairly misunderstood in some respects, uh, but I'll then gradually zoom out to, uh, you know, encompass uh, other parts of the digital economy within view. Uh, so uh, the Alphabet uh, business model, uh, Alphabet being the uh, umbrella company under which uh, Google sits, um, uh, well, 
so what's what's in here? Uh, it's something that people can get confused about uh, because, to be honest, these days uh, Alphabet does a little bit of everything, right? I mean, you've got the traditional search activities, but you also have, uh, you know, some bets in things like healthcare. You've got driverless cars. Uh, so there's a really, you know, quite a lot of things uh, that we are doing. Uh, but as an economist, I like to uh, simplify the picture where uh, possible and, and take a step back. Uh, and my claim to you on this slide is that the core uh, of the business model, the core activity, remains very much uh, from an economic uh, perspective. Uh, the provision of search services uh, on our own properties, uh, so google.com, uh, .co.uk, etc., uh, which are properties uh, that do a sort of matchmaking role uh, between users and their eyeballs on the one hand uh, and uh, advertisers on the other. That's kind of the economic uh, sort of multi-sided platform type uh, vibe that we've got going on here. Uh, so all that is well understood. Uh, the things that are less well understood uh, but are in, entirely publicly available, so it's a surprise that they're poorly understood. Uh, so the uh, 10Ks, uh, our financial filings, are of course uh, you know public, but very few people actually bother to uh, you know look at them in detail, and yet they have a you know whole wealth of information. Uh, so on this slide, you've got uh, you know the 2020 uh, you know figures we could update this, of course. Uh, but, you know, we've got revenues of 180 some uh, billion uh, dollars. Uh, and that's, you know, often what you see in the in the reporting, that sort of top line number. Uh, uh, people don't appreciate that, you know, not all of this is uh, profit. So the net income is only, I mean, I will say $40 billion. So that's a, a net income percentage of 22%. Uh, that's very much underappreciated because a lot of people feel like, uh, all of this stuff is essentially free once you set it up. I mean, that's the software business model. Uh, you sort of, you know, do the fixed cost and then it runs at, you know, essentially zero marginal cost forever and ever. But uh, actually, uh, it takes a lot of money to run, uh, you know, the activities of Alphabet or the activities of Google as a uh, search engine. I mean, data centers, things of that sort. Uh, the costs are outlined, uh, you know, towards the bottom of uh, this table, uh, and they are very significant, uh, not least of which is an R&D uh, expenditure of some $27 billion uh, in that calendar year uh, 2020. Uh, so, you know, that's one bit that's uh, not appreciated. But what I really wanted to, to say in this slide uh, is to back up my claim that uh, the core of a uh, business model remains uh, this kind of you know search services on google.com and the advertising that that goes with it uh, and you can see on the revenue side that 80 percent uh, of the revenues uh, essentially come from advertising uh, and that you when you focus uh, on the advertising slice uh, so this has three pieces essentially there's uh, search ads uh, there's youtube and there's ads that we place across the web uh, so that's the google network uh, and you see that search ads is by far the lion's share at 70 some percent uh, and the remainder uh, is ro split um, i mean let's say 15 15 uh, to round up between youtube uh, and uh, ads that we place as an intermediary on properties across the web the google network uh, little footnote uh, on that google network activity by the way uh, so these are uh, revenues they're not uh, you know intake for google uh, on average 70 percent of those revenues get uh, passed on to publishers and in many cases uh, the percentage is, is much higher so you know this is not just uh, you know money in the bank for google uh, but so i'm gonna focus uh, Again, you know, having simplified the picture a little bit, I'm going to zoom in, uh, you know, to the lion's share, uh, you know, so be thinking about search uh, in the first instance. Uh, and I'm going to ask a couple of key questions where there is often, uh, you know, a lot of uh, mis misperception, uh, really. Uh, so uh, what percentage of uh, search engine result pages, uh, SERPs, uh, carry any ads uh, on Google? Uh, and often I uh, sort of meet a perception that, hey, ads are everywhere and they've kind of, you know, expanded dramatically in recent years and I can't get away from them. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but another uh, question that we'll want to be thinking about is what queries are really the ones that drive uh, Google's uh, revenues in search? So perhaps a surprising answer to uh, the first question is that, uh, well, you know, there are fewer ads than, than you might expect. Uh, and uh, this is data that was actually published uh, in a market study by the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which, uh, you know, of course, there are some sort of brackets uh, so to, pre to preserve some uh, degree of confidentiality. Uh, but they say that uh, the proportion of searches that carry an ad uh, on Google has fallen considerably from uh, 40 to 50% uh, in, you know, early in the last decade uh, to 20 to 30% uh, more uh, recently. Uh, so this is already quite an important statement that's underappreciated. Uh, that means that uh, for 70 to 80% uh, 
uh, of the uh, uh, search results pages that we serve out, uh, Google has uh, no prospect of monetization whatsoever, right? And that's not uh, often appreciated. Uh, the percentage of pages where we do show ads, so this famous 20 to 30 percent, well, uh, they don't all count uh, equally. Uh, you know, some queries uh, are, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, beneficial than others from a sort of revenue generating perspective. Uh, Google has also published uh, in the last few years that uh, less than 5% uh, of our search queries uh, carry a full slate uh, of four text ads, which is the maximum that we carry. Uh, so less than uh, 5%. Uh, so those are the ones that are, uh, you know, the most, you know, highly sought after by uh, advertisers. Uh, so what am I saying here? Uh, the queries that uh, drive uh, revenue uh, are very intuitive. Uh, so they are things like, uh, you know, travel, uh, shopping, uh, you know, financial uh, products, uh, in essence, uh, commercial queries. Uh, so that's where the advertising money is. It's not really uh, where you are making a search to find out, uh, you know, information to answer your uh, history homework for tomorrow, uh, or you have an essay crisis of, uh, of some sort, which uh, none of us know about, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, those of, don't typically carry ads, uh, but the Google business model is uh, we will answer uh, or attempt to answer any question that a user chooses to throw at us. Now, why is all this important or interesting when we think of competition? Uh, because I, I'm going to ask you to place yourself in the shoes uh, of a new entrant uh, who wants to set up a website to make a buck or two online. You have a choice of business model. Uh, so either you can go uh, the Google route uh, and you can make a general promise to answer any query that users throw at you, uh, including the ones that are not profitable, uh, the ones about your history homework. Uh, or you can uh, take a more focused, specialized uh, approach. So you can uh, say, well, I'm going to only focus on this particular commercial category uh, of queries uh, and just do that really, really well. Uh, and unsurprisingly, that's uh, much, uh, a much, much more popular uh, option for uh, entry into uh, you know, uh, competition online. Give you another example from a UK regulator. This is from the Office of Fair Trading's uh, clearance of a Google acquisition. Uh, Google did that quote uh, from you know, about a decade ago. I can't quite remember the year now. Uh, but essentially, this was an acquisition in the consumer finance, uh, you know, price comparison services, uh, you know, sector, uh, and it shows entry uh, into this space. Uh, and so, what you can see is that uh, over time. Uh, you know, heaps of companies are piling into this sort of narrow, uh, you know, segment online, uh, including many household uh, brands in the UK. You all know them. I mean, Confuse.com, Compare the Market, uh, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, really, this is how, uh, you know, competition works. Uh, lots of entry and, you know, lots of keenness to help uh, user needs uh, on commercial uh, you know, queries where the money is, uh, you know, somewhat less keenness to help you out with your uh, history homework where, you know, you have, you know, a sparser, uh, you know, selection uh, there perhaps. Uh, but so that's that's how competition works. I'll give you yet another example. Uh, so this is on the slice uh, of shopping uh, queries where there is uh, an immense battle that's raging, uh, notably between Google, Amazon, uh, eBay, uh, others. Uh, so, uh, you know, people basically want to be the place where, uh, you know, consumers start uh, their shopping uh, searches. Uh, so that's what I mean by shopping starts. Uh, and, uh, you know, here Amazon, I, I have to, I'm sad to report, is doing extremely well. So, you know, on the top uh, part of this slide, you can see some evidence from the US to the effect that, uh, you know, 55% uh, of uh, Americans say that now they start uh, their product searches on Amazon, uh, only 28%, uh, excuse me, doing so on search uh, engines. Uh, and, uh, you know, a driver of this in particular is the very successful Amazon Prime uh, product, which is the bottom of uh, this slide, uh, where you can see that people who use Amazon Prime weekly, uh, well, about 80% of, of them, I mean, 79, uh, say that they start, you know, their shopping searches on, on Amazon as opposed to 12% on Google. Uh, Non-Prime members uh, have a more balanced uh, sort of entry point uh, into shopping, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Prime is an extremely, extremely popular product. I mean, in the US, uh, you know, the figures I've seen are that more than 150 million uh, Americans uh, have uh, Amazon Prime. So that's around half uh, of the population. So uh, incredibly, incredibly significant uh, there. Uh, and so, as I was saying, given that, you know, Google's, uh, you know, commercial model rests uh, on, you know, a narrower, uh, you know, slice of queries. So these commercial queries of which shopping are an important part, uh, this is, of course, a highly significant competitive uh, development. Um, 
taking a step back on, on all of this, what I'm encouraging you to, to see really is that competition really ought to be best appreciated on uh, a category by category um, um, lens, uh, really, uh, and that you lose a lot of information by doing uh, what I call is uh, linguistic uh, market definition, which is uh, you know, an erroneous way of, of doing things in, in my books, to be candid. Uh, so this is where you say uh, we have this linguistic concept uh, of general search engines. Uh, so these are people like Google, uh, Bing, uh, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, et cetera. I mean, it's a sort of finite uh, set of people. Uh, and uh, you look at that set of people, so driven by the linguistic concept. And of course, you know, Google is by far the largest, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of analysis fro flows from that, uh, but it doesn't capture uh, you know, this economic reality of where competition is actually taking place, where the rubber meets the, uh, the road, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of one I think I want a message I wanted to to share uh, with you, but so far we've only discussed uh, competition in you know online in terms of you know uh, these various verticals. Let's take a step back and look at competition more broadly uh, across the, the tech field, and in particular, uh, let's look at these famous GAFA companies everyone uh, you know talks about or GAFAM, uh, including Microsoft. Uh, and if you actually sit down and sort of write down a number of uh, sort of you know tech uh, areas uh, which are the rows in this table uh, and uh, you know have a little reflection time with yourself as to well who among these uh, are competing in these areas uh, you very quickly realize that uh, there is a heck of a lot of uh, competition in this matrix even if you just uh, you know focus on these big uh, players uh, so to take an example, browsers, uh, all of these companies uh, except Facebook are providing uh, consumers with browsers uh, or cloud services uh, where there is a very intense competition between uh, Amazon, Microsoft uh, and Google, uh, where Google is, alas, actually uh, number three uh, in this play, uh, space and playing a little bit of a, of a catch up game. Um, but, um, you know, on and on and on, you can go area by area and you have, you know, this sort of picture uh, emerging. So. Fair amount of competition in uh, in digital, uh, which does not mean, uh, or I don't mean to convey that you know everything is always rosy uh, in digital. It does not, uh, of course, need to be. Uh, but there are usually are signs uh, where things are not going well, or um, in terms of innovation, uh, which I often suggest is it should be a thermometer uh, for uh, you know where to focus on in terms of enforcement. Uh, and I'll give you an example of the browser space, where of course there was uh, in the uh, first uh, decade of a century, uh, lots of European Commission activity, uh, so vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Microsoft and Internet Explorer. Uh, so what happened in, in this space? Uh, well, uh, on the horizontal axis, you've got uh, time and you've got the dates at which various versions of Internet Explorer were released. Uh, and on the vertical axis, you've got uh, the share of the browser space uh, going to Internet Explorer. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, you know over time internet explorer of course becomes more successful uh, in this space uh, until we reach uh, internet explorer 6 uh, and then there's a gap of some five uh, six years before the next version uh, of internet explorer uh, 7 is released uh, and so that's what i call an, an innovation gap really i mean uh, microsoft went into maintenance mode uh, on this product they had basically uh, you know become uh, you know, somewhat entrenched, uh, you you might say, uh, and uh, so it took Firefox, uh, you know, coming along and uh, nibbling uh, a little bit uh, at their heels uh, before you know they again restarted, uh, you know, the innovation engine. Uh, so things of this sort uh, are what I would be on the lookout for uh, to identify uh, problems. Uh, but by and large, I mean, I mentioned the R and D, uh, you know, spending of the Alphabet Group earlier. Um, by and large, in the digital economy. Uh, you, uh, you know, I do get the picture of people, you know, racing uh, very, very hard uh, all over the place. It uh, reminds me of uh, Nobel laureate uh, John Hicks uh, saying that the best uh, of all monopoly profits is a quiet life, uh, and uh, that's something you don't find, uh, you know, very much in in many spaces, at least of a, of a digital economy. Uh, but this was a little bit of scene setting. Let me uh, provide you with a more, uh, you know, targeted, even though uh, you know, very brief uh, commentary uh, on data. Uh, which is, you know, uh, really a centerpiece of many uh, conversations about, uh, you know, the digital uh, economy. So yes, what about uh, all of the data? Uh, and so here is the actual sort of view of a, uh, you know, typical big tech firm that many, uh, you know, commentators might have. Uh, data hungry, uh, really um, milking, uh, you know, user data, you know, uh, minting uh, billions on the back of it, and uh, really they ought to be writing checks to uh, users for, you know, all of these uh, mana from heaven that they're absorbing and sort of, you know, trans 
transforming into dollars, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to do, as you would expect, a little bit of a reality check. Uh, and I'm, you know, first of all, I'm going to sort of check in on the absolute uh, value of the money at hand here on a per user basis. And I'm going to uh, do this uh, using Facebook uh, for a simple reason. I mean, Facebook uh, publishes their, their RP, uh, ARPU, average revenue per user. Uh, it's particularly useful. Um, uh, easy for them to track uh, users because, of course, Facebook is something that only has a signed-in state, so everybody needs to be signed in. And so they have actually published uh, these figures. Uh, and you can see that uh, in 2020, the ARPU was some uh, $32. These are sort of you know global averages. Um, but these are uh, revenues, uh, you should remind yourself. So uh, these, these are not profits. Uh, so the profits will be a fraction of this. I mean, if you take, you know, we were mentioning the net margin of the alphabet group uh, in the low 20s. Uh, if you apply 20% to these $32, you're left with 6 to $7. Uh, in fairness, uh, Facebook does have higher margins uh, that I remember. So the figure will be higher. I mean, you can do the math. We're just talking orders of magnitude here, as is typical of uh, economists. Uh, but so, you know, six of seven dollars uh, in profit per user. Uh, and uh, that will be made of a whole bunch of components, right? I mean, Facebook, technological contributions, etc. It's not just the data. Uh, so if you're thinking of, uh, you know, writing checks and data being, you know, hyper valuable, well, this kind of recalibrates, uh, you know, a little bit uh, the, um, uh, you know, quantum, uh, I would say. So I only mean to, you know, insert uh, this kind of, um, uh, you know, center of gravity, you know, not to say that when you add it up, it's, uh, it, it's uh, trivial, etc. cetera, uh, but uh, it's already, I think, uh, insightful uh, to have this. The other message uh, I wanted to pass on is that, uh, you know, we often talk of data, uh, you know, in very general uh, terms. Uh, and of course, uh, in practice, things are much more complex. Uh, so there are areas where data matters quite a bit and areas where it matters less. Uh, and I'm going to uh, give you an example of um, uh, monetization, uh, really. So when you use data for uh, advertising uh, purposes. Uh, and so the next two slides are fairly wordy, but I'll just talk you uh, through them. So first of all, an example of situations where uh, data can matter a good deal. Uh, so this is a, a quote from, again, the CMA uh, from their market market study from a couple of years ago. Uh, and essentially, we are looking at uh, the display advertising context. So these are uh, ads you meet across the web as you uh, sort of move from website to website. Uh, and those ads can be targeted in a whole manner of uh, ways. Uh, so uh, the contextual targeting is perhaps the most basic form of targeting, where essentially you have a website about uh, fishing, uh, and you show ads about fishing rods. Uh, so kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but oftentimes, the context is not uh, as powerful as in this simple example. So uh, imagine you're a newspaper publisher and you have a story about an earthquake in Haiti. Uh, the context is not particularly propitious to showing ads, uh, and therefore you ideally want to lean uh, into other signals. So uh, maybe the cookie that is requesting this story has been uh, visiting a lot of automobile uh, sites uh, recently, and so it makes sense to show them car ads. Uh, for example. Uh, so that's something known as retargeting uh, and uh, very important in, in those contexts, especially for actually the, the press uh, you know, sector. Uh, so what is the CMA doing here? They looked at some uh, experimental evidence uh, submitted by Google and you know, did their own calculations. And uh, they found that blocking uh, third-party cookies uh, decreases uh, short-run uh, publisher revenue by uh, you know, 70%, uh, essentially, compared to a, a control uh, group. Uh, so this is a situation where uh, data adds a lot of value, uh, right? Because again, as, as I mentioned, you don't have a lot uh, else in many cases to, to go on. Uh, so this is display ads across the web, uh, maybe ads on a platform like Facebook, uh, where uh, you're essentially browsing through the product, wanting to talk to your family and friends, but you don't come with uh, you know, very clear uh, intentionality. So the platform needs a fair amount of information in order to show uh, relevant ads. Uh, the situation is quite different uh, in a context like search, uh, where uh, search targeting, uh, this is an overquote by the CMA, uh, is overwhelmingly driven uh, by query uh, and location. Uh, so it's very intuitive. Um, actually, the, uh, you know, it, it's not rocket science to know that if you type buy lawnmower on Google, uh, we should show you ads about 
lawn mowers, uh, and ideally ads that are uh, lawn mowers that are available in your local area, either for shipping or in shops near you, uh, etc. So as determined very roughly by you know IP address or something of that sort. So query and location drive the targeting. Uh, there are uh, other signals that uh, you know. Uh, advertisers can use, you know, the inferred demographic things of that sort, uh, but they have a very marginal impact because the intent uh, signal that uh, you express uh, in your query is just uh, so powerful. Uh, so main point I wanted to say, whereas uh, in um, you know, a lot of these policy discussions, we treat, uh, you know, data a little bit in a, a uniform, uh, you know, fashion. Uh, actually, when you dig into the details, uh, you know, like it, it varies quite a lot in terms of its uh, of its impact. A word about regulation. Uh, so, uh, you know, data uh, is held to be the lifeblood of a, a digital economy. So there is a desire to uh, essentially, uh, you know, break, uh, you know, uh, data piggy banks uh, of, uh, you know, incumbents and, you know, spread some data to uh, upstart rivals who are said to have great ideas, but don't have the data to train up their models, etc. Uh, so increasingly, you see a call for, uh, you know, more data sharing. Uh, I'll just say a word uh, on this. Um, in that from at a very high level, I, I see two different types of models. Uh, on the one hand, you've got what I call consumer-led uh, data sharing, which is a uh, has been the direction of travel uh, of a lot of Google initiatives in the past. I won't unpack them in the interest of time. Uh, but it's also uh, you know, the model of, say, the UK uh, open banking regime, where uh, really it's about data portability. It's about the user taking an affirmative action saying, uh, hey, I'm currently on platform A, but I want to try the services of uh, platform B, uh, and I you know, want to be able to move my data in order to do so. Um, a very different sort of model is one that we are seeing, uh, you know, increasingly sort of being pushed for uh, or uh, codified, which is what I call bulk uh, data sharing uh, between companies. Uh, so these are situations where the user, uh, you know, does not uh, have a say, uh, where essentially the incumbent needs to, uh, you know, uh, pack up a bunch of data uh, and ship it over to these upstart rivals uh, in the aggregate uh, so that they can do their own little machine learning cooking, uh, you know, on the side and, you know, hopefully then uh, become competitive forces or, or so the uh, story goes. Uh, this raises more uh, complex questions uh, because, of course, since the user is not involved, you somehow have to scrub the data sets to avoid uh, sharing uh, you know, private information. Uh, and a cautionary tale in this space uh, is you know, one I, I mentioned at the bottom of the slide, the AOL search data leak of 2006, uh, where AOL uh, had perfectly good intentions in that they wanted to uh, provide uh, data to researchers. Uh, so they anonymized uh, you know, a portion of their search logs and published it. Uh, and I say anonymized uh, between inverted quotes because they thought they had, uh, but some enterprising New York Times journalists uh, actually uh, scanned, uh, you know, through uh, the data and were able to identify individuals uh, showing up at the uh, doorstep of, uh, you know, an old lady in the Midwest or, you know, various uh, people they were actually able to to identify who were, uh, you know, present in the data. So uh, it presents uh, you know, many complex questions, but questions we're going to have to address because that's the direction of travel uh, of some uh, regulations. So watch this space there. Um, Self-preferencing, which is the last uh, you know, part of my uh, teeing up uh, talk, uh, I wanted to uh, you know, pick up one specific strand uh, of conduct uh, that is getting a lot of uh, airtime in these digital economy uh, conversations. Uh, so so-called self-preferencing, i.e. when you give uh, when you're a sort of uh, you know platform and you give yourself a, a leg up uh, somewhere, uh, this is sometimes discussed uh, in terms of a, a simple metaphor of uh, you know it's terribly unfair to be both uh, umpire and player. Uh, so you know you hear some you know politicians uh, mentioning a metaphor of this kind, and uh, you know it's a good soundbite in in many ways, but is it a good representation of what's happening uh, in the digital economy? And I guess they have in mind, you know, situations like, you know, Amazon having a marketplace, but also having, uh, you know, its own uh, brand products on that marketplace and, uh, you know, being a participant uh, there. So uh, umpire and player, you know, very nice soundbite, but uh, you know, the economy does not uh, really work, uh, you know, in, in quite uh, that way, uh, because the mere observation that uh, a company treats itself uh, differently from the way it treats other uh, is not a very reliable line to uh, distinguish anti-competitive from uh, pro-competitive conduct. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, you know, companies do not compete uh, by treating uh, each other in the same way. Um, and if they do, you often have 
cartel vibes actually. Uh, companies compete uh, by treating their own businesses differently from, and in fact, improving their own uh, businesses relative to uh, those uh, of uh, competitors. Uh, and things like technical integration are well recognized uh, drivers uh, of uh, competition uh, and innovation. Uh, none of this is rocket science, by the way. I mean, it's reflected in uh, jurisprudence everywhere, uh, the Bundesgerichtshof, the Court of Justice. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are, this is a well understood uh, message. Uh, and what I'm trying to drive to is that, uh, you know, self preferencing in itself uh, is something entirely banal, uh, which happens throughout, uh, you know, the economy, you know, in any supermarket, their own brand products, etc. Uh, but uh, in addition, it's something that's ill-suited for very, uh, you know, black and white uh, types of, of determinations. Uh, and let me give you a very, uh, you know, specific, uh, you know, example. So we had a case, uh, you know, just in on point, uh, Streetmap uh, v Google, which was actually a UK case examined um, or adjudicated on by the High Court of England and Wales. Uh, now, as you all know from personal experience, I hope you're Google users, uh, so when you, uh, run searches where a map is relevant. Google uh, search shows you a map uh, that comes from Google Maps. Uh, and so StreetMap uh, was a rival mapping company and complained that uh, you know this practice, the way we did it, was uh, terribly unfair. Uh, so they filed a claim uh, midway through 2014. A trial uh, was held, extremely full trial, lots of cross-examination, etc. I mean, the question was very thoroughly analyzed uh, and judgment was rendered uh, early uh, in 2016. Uh, what the court found was essentially threefold um, in my books. Uh, first of all, they found that the uh, integration of maps uh, in search was an uh, indisputable product improvement uh, and was pro-competitive. Uh, the court also found that uh, on the facts of the case, uh, there was uh, no appreciable effect uh, of competition in mapping. Uh, and that in the alternative, uh, even if that was wrong, uh, the court made the further finding that Google was uh, objectively uh, justified uh, to only show maps from its own service, uh, because showing maps uh, from rivals would have involved uh, additional latency uh, or inaccuracies. Uh, so this is kind of on, on the facts uh, of the case. Uh, and I you know, uh, mention this as an example of the sorts of determinations that you can make uh, when you really look at things in the detail, uh, as opposed to having a black or white rule of thumb, you know, self-preferencing, good or bad, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I do not mean to suggest that self-preferencing is always and everywhere uh, good. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple more examples mentioned on, on the slide here. Uh, we all know the Microsoft Media Player uh, case, again, from the first uh, decade uh, of a century, uh, where the European Commission found that the integration of Media Player uh, with Windows uh, was, uh, you know, not acceptable. Uh, there was one, uh, you know, particular uh, feature of, of that case that, you know, stands out for me what the, in that the integration was actually a, a product uh, degradation. So Media Player was not... Uh, particularly good uh, compared to other offerings. Uh, Microsoft admitted during the case that there was no uh, technical reason for the integration. So there were uh, a number of uh, you know, facets there. And uh, we're also talking of a time uh, when uh, distribution of services, I mean, you know, internet speeds were you know, very different and reliability, et cetera. So alternative distribution channels were much uh, less effective. So uh, you have a constellation of parameters that uh, you know, led the European Commission to uh, find that the conduct there was, was not right. Uh, so uh, there's also a, another reference for uh, uh, if you want to dig, uh, you know, further into legal uh, history, Deca Navigator, that's a radio navigation systems case from the uh, late 1980s, which can also be described in self-preferencing terms uh, and where there was also a product degradation, uh, you know, element to the story. Uh, so, you know, yes, there can be definitely, uh, you know, such uh, cases. Uh, but we're now moving into a world where uh, we are talking of regulating uh, self-preferencing. And uh, that's something that as an economist gives me a lot of pause uh, because when I uh, now take a step back and, you know, this is my final, uh, you know, point uh, before we, we discuss this live. Um, so when I, when I look uh, at the way the economy is working right now, we are in what I would call an era of combinatorial uh, innovation. Uh, so this is similar to what we had uh, during the industrial uh, revolution where suddenly a number of standardized components became available. Uh, gears, pulleys, uh, levers, uh, and you could, you know, take those components and combine them and recombine them to make a whole variety of different uh, machines. Uh, I think uh, this is a good analogy for what's going on right now in terms of digital components. 
uh, where if you think of an application like Uber, uh, I mean, the components themselves are not, uh, you know, rocket science. There's a mapping component, there's an electronic transactions component, there's a sort of review scoring type component, uh, but the integration of them, of course, revolutionized, uh, you know, the transport uh, field. Uh, and so there's a lot of playing around with components, combining and recombining them right now, uh, and rules targeting self-preferencing will go to the heart uh, of that uh, you know, mechanism that has generated a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, so I'm not a pessimist by any means. This is mostly a call for pragmatism and intelligence when we uh, make these assessments uh, from a regulatory lens uh, so that you know, the growth uh, that has been generated over the last couple of decades uh, in this space can, can keep going forward. Uh, and on that note, uh, I hope I've teed up uh, or opened enough boxes for us to discuss. Uh, feel free to open others uh, during the Q&A, but I will uh, stop here and, and look forward to your questions. Uh, so, you know, thanks in advance, Alexei. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, I would like to solicit some, some questions from the audience. So there is this ask a question button at the at the bottom of your screen so please you start uh, that uh, some questions will appear in the chat i will probably start uh with a following question so you had uh, this very nice uh, slide with uh, entry time in your various price comparison websites and i noticed that around 2009 2010 there was a google logo there and not later than uh, this morning, I was searching uh, for renewal of car insurance. And of course, I used Google to find the price comparison website. And there was money saving supermarket and uh, some others from your list. Uh, but I didn't see any price comparison bit from Google itself. So why there was no self-preferencing in this case? Uh, you know, good, good question, Alexei. So, uh, you know, that slide comes from uh, so an OFT decision when we bought uh, Beat That Quote, which was actually a UK company active in this field. Uh, so we tried, uh, you know, to, um, you know, essentially with the expertise of a, of a company, once we brought that in-house, we tried to develop, you know, products to surface, uh, you know, insights uh, in search results about, you say, credit cards, et cetera, uh, and, uh, you know, help answer, uh, you, you know, users' uh, needs uh, better that way. Uh, so we we tried that out, but eventually we found that you know, it was not working out, and we discontinued the product, uh, which is actually a really good example of, uh, you know, how you know users consumers are not cheap, uh, right? I mean, they need to, you know, they can vote with their feet, uh, and this is a great example uh, of Google not being, you know, King Midas. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people look at us as if we we are, you know, king makers and have this, uh, you know, power to just, you know, reshape the market at will. Uh, this is a great example uh, of a situation where we fail and we discontinued, uh, you know, this particular product that had been, uh, you know, we actually had already a product on the market, but reinforced, uh, you know, by this acquisition. So uh, you're right, we no longer have, uh, you know, such units. Good, thank you very much. Uh, well, let me check once again the question chart. So I think there are no questions. So let, let me then go with, with another one, and that probably will be like more uh, broad and general uh, question. Um, so I think I think apart from the concern you 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 kind of described about about consumer data, there is of course a big concern that large because nowadays firms can essentially get access to wide markets only via large platforms. Would that be uh, search on Google or Amazon? Um, the platforms of course squeeze manufacturers quite a bit their profits, and that has a long-term detrimental effect on innovation. So if you kind of take that angle of the problem, so what would be uh, your view on how to overcome the potential, uh, uh, the potential kind of issues here in the long run? So, you know, interesting question. And, and you sort of went into two different ways, uh, which is that you said, you know, some of these platforms and, you know, you were going a little bit more on a marketplace slash Amazon angle. So I'll stick with, with your example there. Uh, you know, uh, this platform is, uh, you know, indispensable because it gives you such amazing distributional uh, reach, etc. So it's uh, absolutely great for sellers. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, their margins are squeezed and it's terribly sad. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, that sort of compromises product development or, I mean, that, that essentially was your question. But, you know, you had two angles where on the one hand there was 
this you know fantastic benefit uh, you know brought by the platform uh, on the other hand there was this alleged uh, you know this benefit where you know i don't know so much if you know the extent to which Amazon would be responsible in your example, as opposed to competition, uh, you know, on Amazon's, uh, you know, marketplace. So what was doing the margin, uh, you know, squeezing in, in your your case? But I would say, you know, you have to take a step back, you know, put everything on the balance. Uh, there was this sort of, you know, great rocket booster of, you know, the platform giving a distributional advantage, uh, but, but then there were other factors that, that you brought in. So it needs to be sort of seen in the round. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So I, th I think we have a question from an audience. Uh, the question is that politics slightly further afield than the EU, US, UK domain, such as manufacture in Hong Kong, China, may lead to exogenous factors, uh, other, uh, to exogenous factors than combined focus drawn on in your slides. Is the economics of intellectual property the starter motor? of developments in future decades. So I guess the question is mainly, yes, of what would be the impact of this economics of intellectual property in the context of kind of presence of countries like uh, China and, and so on? So, you know, it's, um, it, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, intellectual property is one of the uh, ingredients uh, in terms of uh, uh, incentives to innovate, uh, right? So the, the ability to, you know, keep your uh, inventions to yourself in a sense for, you know, a certain, uh, you know, period. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily over index on, uh, you know, intellectual uh, property because not everything qualifies, you know, formally as IP. Uh, a lot of stuff in our field uh, is, you know, other forms of protection. You know, you've got copyright, but you've got trade secrets in general, uh, and those really matter uh, quite a bit. So uh, I wouldn't just think about intellectual property. I would think about incentives to uh, innovate, uh, you know, more generally. I think you asked about China because of the sort of, you know, IP angle, uh, where, of course, China's attitude uh, on these matters has been, you know, changed changing over the decades as, as they have been, uh, you know, themselves uh, investing more uh, into, uh, you know, even quantum computing, things of that sort. I mean, their investments in R&D are extremely uh, heavy uh, these days, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, so they are a force to be reckoned with. And so, yes, they have changed their attitudes to IP, but more uh, broadly, I'm thinking about things as an economist in terms of incentives to, to innovate rather than, you know, specific legal boxes. But, you know, very good question. Good, thank you very much. We have another good question from the audience. So, uh, right and ownership of uh, privacy data is abused by these tech companies? Question mark. What are the options for consumers? Uh, so, I mean, you know, another very important uh, question. Uh, so, uh, I would, you know, like maybe take issue with uh, the premise that uh, you know there is abuse uh, going on. So. Trust is, uh, you know, the bedrock uh, of a number of, uh, you know, digital products. Uh, clearly, if you stop trusting the, the products, uh, you know, you have an ability to walk away. Uh, there is uh, an important consumer demand uh, for, uh, you know, increasing privacy protections that we've, uh, you know, heard uh, very well over the last, uh, you know, couple of decades. Uh, so it's now in every conversation and uh, it's now uh, really in every, you know, product design uh, we do, uh, you know, there is a privacy working group. There are, you know, you create sort of privacy design documents. So there's privacy by design that is sort of now happy, happening, uh, you know, at our end uh, when we ideate uh, new products. And the direction of travel has really been to give, uh, you know, users, uh, you know, control uh, and, you know, transparency choice control, really. So if you go into your, uh, you know, Google account, for example, uh, you will see exactly, you know, uh, you will have options on, you know, I don't like personalized advertising, so I want to switch that off. You know, that's an option you have. Uh, you have options around, well, I do want to have some degree of targeting in my advertising because, uh, you know, I prefer relevant ads as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, out of the blue ads that have nothing to do with me. But you can control, uh, you know, what the targeting is about. Uh, you can also see exactly what data Google holds over you, uh, delete it. Uh, and we've made this very easily because we think about behavioral economics as well, you know, you cannot overburden consumers with, uh, you know, too many choices. So uh, consumers might like to have automated rules of thumb. Uh, so you can now set in your Google account an automated rule of thumb that says, uh, Google, every three months, I want you to delete uh, my data, uh, basically. So I don't need to sort of log into my account and sort of do so granularly. You can now actually even set a, a rule of thumb. So these are, you know, developments that have taken place uh, over, 
uh, years. Uh, I mentioned search, but the same is true uh, of Android, uh, where you know we've increasingly uh, you know made the permissions uh, you know system of you know what data you share with particular apps um, in, you know in such uh, that users have more control. So that's been our direction of travel. It's generally speaking the direction of travel uh, of uh, the sector as a whole. Uh, you know. Uh, you look at Apple, privacy is a big part uh, of their messaging, so a big you know, selling point for them. So everybody is uh, you know, going in this uh, direction. There are different ways of doing it. But as I say, uh, trust is the bedrock of these products uh, and it's taken extremely, uh, extremely seriously. I hope it's answered your question. Feel free to uh, you know, pop up over uh, you know, questions if, if I didn't quite hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, it's good enough for me, but yeah, maybe the water would uh, follow up. Follow up. So uh, there's another uh, very interesting question. So it's more like uh, uh, taking the modeling perspective. So do you think economic modeling is up to date for analyzing competition in the technology sector versus historically tra traditional sectors, specifically due to the wide ranging product offering by companies such as those in uh, GAFAM and it's used by consumers? Yes, good question. Uh, so I often take, uh, I mean, look, I, I'm an economist through and through, as I as I said. So I, uh, I you know, have a very high opinion of our discipline, um, you know, here. Uh, and I often uh, take the analogy that uh, you don't need to reinvent physics just because an engineer has invented a faster uh, airplane, uh, right? So the core uh, concepts of economics of, you know, uh, substitutions versus complement, complements, which is, you know, the bread and butter of industrial organization that you know, still drives a lot of the thinking and, you know, a, a lot of the concepts that we use, the multi-sided market uh, paradigm, I mean, that goes to the work of Jean Tirole, who received, you know, his Nobel Prize, you know, partly on the on the back of uh, work of this sort. So uh, economics actually as a toolkit is very well armed conceptually to approach the digital economy. Uh, the digital economy is more challenging maybe at an empirical uh, level. Uh, where, uh, you know, because these are, you know, multi-sided products uh, that uh, often have, you know, zero pricing on one side of the market. So, you know, products are free for consumers, advertisers pay for the uh, whole thing, etc. So that does create uh, some analytical complications when you're thinking of running, you know, um, uh, you know, analysis that, that we run in, um, you know, competition policy, like the, you know, hypothetical monopolies, test, SNP, you know, things of that sort are, you know, harder to, you know, perhaps implement, just practically speaking, but, you know, they're hard in a lot of sectors in, in any event. Um, so, you know, there are some particularities of the digital economy that, you know, create challenges, but conceptually speaking, I think we are very well armed. Uh, so I don't feel like I have, you know, massive analytical gaps uh, when I think of situations that uh, arise at Google. Uh, and while I said that the digital economy has presented some challenges, it also has some benefits because, of course, uh, you know, data is plentiful. And so we can do, uh, you know, A, B, uh, randomized control trial experiments all over the place to empirically figure out the answer to, uh, you know, a whole bunch of questions. Uh, but economics... Uh, is incredibly valuable as is recognized by uh, you know silicon valley and you know other tech uh, companies in that uh, everybody now has uh, you know some sort of chief economist team like uh, you know the one i'm uh, i mean at google uh, sort of to think about uh, you know, problems, not just in the policy, uh, you know, field, which has been the locus of our conversation today, uh, but also business, uh, you know, problems. Um, so uh, economics has a very bright future uh, in tech and, you know, for students uh, out there who might be listening, uh, you know, think of tech as, as one, of, one of your options if you're economically minded. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have another uh, very interesting question. So to it, to what extent uh, do economics, like storage costs, uh, cause a company like Google to delete all the personal data anyway, even when the individual doesn't request it? So yes, uh, you know, well, thank you for, uh, you know, asking this, recognizing that storage does not, uh, you know, come for free. Uh, also, as I mentioned from the accounts, I mean, data centers are, you know, incredibly expensive to uh, run, etc. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a question a little bit about, you know, what data we are, uh, you know, talking about here. Uh, so uh, if it's your, you know, photos stored in your Google account, we're not just going to, you know, delete them uh, just because they're a burden to us, uh, you know, without asking for, uh, you know, your consent. I mean, you know, that's your uh, information, really, your data, your docs, I mean, you know, you name it. Uh, and that, 
I, you know, that's um, unless we discontinue a product, you know, which has, uh, you know, happened. Uh, so, you know, that, that's kind of not a, a candidate for deletion. Uh, maybe you're more referring to, uh, you know, the sort of data that we might observe uh, or about user activity on our products, uh, but does not necessarily qualify as, you know, personal data in the same way that it's your photos or your uh, documents. Uh, and, you uh, you know, like uh, just, you know, we observe that uh, in response to the search query, a particular website, you know, seems to be popular with users or seems to answer uh, their question. Therefore, we, you know, we use that information uh, as a factor when we think of, you know, what, uh, how should that website rank uh, within search results? So obviously that information is there for a sort of product improvement, uh, you know, perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, like you don't need to, uh, you know, go back to the beginning of the internet and, you know, keep that data out there. First of all, the uh, internet changes all of the time. So uh, information from a while back is not as relevant as information you're seeing right now. Uh, so, you know, there is a, a very natural uh, you know, drop-off point in the usefulness uh, of data. Uh, so all data uh, does not have the same properties as fresher uh, data is number one. Uh, number two, there's also, I mean, for the uh, people who are stats-minded among you, uh, you know, the law of diminishing returns is always there and bites, uh, right? Uh, so this is like, um, you know, to take a simple example in a polling context, you might uh, survey a thousand people about, you know, the next election uh, and your margin of error is plus or minus 3%. Uh, if you survey 10,000 people, uh, your margin of error will uh, diminish. It will be plus or minus 1%. Uh, but notice that you've multiplied your data by 10, uh, but only divided your margin of error by 3. Uh, so this is diminishing returns at work. So in essence, uh, you know, Data is not a sort of manna from heaven. It's not something that, you know, the higher you pile it up, uh, you know, the better. Uh, there are a number of statistical properties which indeed make you think economically about, you know, how much data do I need? Uh, and generally speaking, uh, the direction of travel of, of a lot of ma machine learning and engineering is to be uh, more economical of data, uh, which is also partly correlated with the previous conversation we were having about, uh, you know, privacy. Uh, and you know smarter ways uh, of using smaller data sets and you know generalizing learnings from that. Uh, so again, I, I hope that uh, answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. We have another question in chat. Uh, the question asks because uh, data has such a great value to these large firms in order to innovate in this new era. How significant is the challenge to overcome a consumer stigma about big companies holding data? And presumably it is not helped by events uh, such as the AOL leak, despite uh, good intentions. Uh, you know, a, a very good question. So again, we're here in the field of, you know, how much uh, does that actually help, you know, help you innovate, compete? How important is it to, you know, be able to tap uh, into existing sort of troves of, um, you know, data? So generally speaking, and, you know, this is a message you'll hear in, you know, in a few other places, I feel like the conversation um, around competition innovation is over indexing on uh, you know data uh, as a factor of production uh, and under indexing on other uh, factors of production and I would say uh, engineering talent is a much more uh, important uh, factor of production uh, so my boss our uh, chief economist Halverian has this uh, joke where he says well uh, you know if a UFO were to sort of you know swoop in uh, to earth and land in the Google campus uh, and uh, you know uh, vacuum uh, all of our data, uh, for sure it would be sort of a blow, but you know, within uh, a few weeks we'd be up and running as normal uh, sort of again. Uh, if on the other hand, the UFO were to uh, sort of land and kidnap all of our engineers, I mean, it would be a disaster. We'd have to basically, uh, you know, shut down. Uh, so uh, it's obviously sort of said in jest, uh, but it does give you a sort of a sense of where uh, you know, we place the value on, you know, the engineering talent. Uh, the Andreas Weigand, who is former chief scientist of Amazon, I mean, mentioned a sort of literally a, uh, you know, a arms race uh, for hiring engineers, uh, you know, into, into these various companies. Uh, so uh, data is a little bit uh, over-indexed uh, in terms of being a sort of binding constraint in order to be able to progress in innovation, uh, because, you know, data in today's world is really quite plentiful. Uh, and for sure, you sometimes have to be creative in order to get uh, the right data set. But I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, creativity in, in, in this field. So how did Google enter uh, sort of, you know, voice recognition? Uh, so uh, nowadays voice recognition is a very important you know, part of search, you can run vocal searches, you have, uh, you know, various digital assistants, I mean, the Google Assistant, you've got Alexa, Cortana, I mean, a number of, uh, you know, these things are out there. Uh, but 
uh, in, back in 2007, we foresaw uh, that voice input was going to be uh, something important. Uh, but we were in a, a funny situation at Google where we had neither data in this field nor uh, expertise. Uh, so the first thing we did is we hired the expertise. So we hired a bunch of you know, really competent people in this domain, which was a good step forward, but we still had no data. Uh, so uh, what did we do? Uh, we were very creative instead of you know, sitting uh, on our hands and sort of whining that it was a very you know, terrible circumstance. Uh, we created a product called uh, Goog411. Uh, so this is after the uh, you know keys you typed in your uh, phone in the US. It was a vocal uh, assistance service, you know, by telephone, uh, where uh, you would uh, you know call in and say you know I want the address for Joe's Pizza uh, in Palo Alto, and the service would say Oh, do you mean John's Pizza in Palo Alto? No, no, Joe's Pizza in Palo Alto. So you know users would have all sorts of conversations. And so number one, we actually set up a service that was helpful. I mean, it's it's you know, now a sort of relic uh, historically, and it's been discontinued, uh, but it was helpful to users and it helped us, uh, you know, actually refine our models. And this came uh, out of us uh, being a little bit creative and, and innovating. And uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, that's kind of what I, what I tell people who say, oh, I don't have the data to do A, B or C. Uh, you know, you have to be a little bit, uh, you know, creative in, in many cases. Um, hope that didn't take us down a, a rabbit hole. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh check there. yes i think we answered all all the questions from the chat uh, so let me ask you one more question we have a remaining four or four minutes on, on the regulation bit so kind of now we uh sometimes hear these uh, uh calls uh for regulating the fees which platforms charge and usually it's when the platform charges some percentage of revenue uh, do you think that's in this case like a Google model, which would be like introducing some position auctions, uh, sort of give some immunity against that type of regulation? That's why we see like companies, for example, like Booking.com now also moving from charging a fixed percentage of of, of the revenue uh, towards uh, like position auction uh, in the in this kind of consumer in the, in consumer search. Um, so, I mean, you know, interesting question. And so you, you're right, Alexei, there's, uh, you know, more uh, scrutiny being applied these days to, uh, you know, a number of, uh, you know, charging mechanisms uh, around tech, maybe in, uh, you know, app stores is perhaps the, the case in point. That's, uh, you know, the hottest where you have a number of cases, uh, you know, internationally. Uh, so uh, position auctions, I mean, obviously that was designed long, long ago, you know, without, um, you know, just because it's a very efficient way to sell search advertising uh, in particular, not with, uh, you know, regulation in mind uh, at all. Uh, would it make it immune to regulatory scrutiny? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, the vehicle uh, or the, the the mode of pricing, uh, you know, does not uh, immediately make you sort of, you know, jump out uh, of scrutiny. Uh, so, so I wouldn't say that. I just say it's a sort of very efficient system. But you're right. There is, uh, you know, increased attention uh, both under, uh, you know, current, uh, you know, regulatory slash antitrust regime on on fees, but also in uh, stuff that's coming down the line. Uh, great. Yes. So thank you very much, Fabian. I I think, uh, yeah, so we don't have any more questions. Thank you very much for your time and for a very interesting presentation and answers. I'm uh, I'm on mute for the nth time in the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Alexei, for uh, you know hosting so uh, uh, graciously, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for for tuning in. It's it's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you for the great questions. So I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, take care, and uh, from all, all of us from California. Bye.